preparations we've been making to get our children ready to be vaccinated. So first of all, let's just look at some of the numbers and how we're doing. Uh, COVID numbers are looking good. We uh, launched last week our, our centralized COVID hub so you don't have such a hassle trying to identify all the different sources of information that are important to you. And uh, what I want to say about that is we had over 38,500 unique views. I had no idea there were that many reporters in the state of New York. That's extraordinary. So uh, that's what we're talking about there. So good news on our data hub. Our COVID update, um, want to make sure that we look at the numbers. Is that what's on the screen? I think I missed one here. Okay, let's go back. Uh, the seven day average, looking better. Uh, looking like we've hit a nice plateau for now. Some of the uh, areas around the North Country, Western New York, and Central and Capital can do a little bit better, but I think Bohawk Valley, we're, we're making good progress. And I'm, I'm pleased with these numbers, particularly as we talked about this trend of heading into the fall season, our vulnerabilities are there. And also we don't look at just that, we also look at the, uh, the per 100,000 uh, updates. So we have, we were dropping. We were dropping our regional cases per 100,000. So that's, that's uh, improving dramatically there as well. So we're monitoring those closely. Also looking at our hospitalizations, nice trend there. You can look at about where we were last year, um, but then this is what keeps me up at night, that spike you see. Uh, that's what happened last year, Halloween, who would have thought, but that became the first date when our numbers started really going up. Then we hit the uh, Thanksgiving holiday, we hit the uh, Jewish holidays, the Christian holidays, we hit New Year's Eve, hit the Super Bowl, and only after that trend did we start seeing the numbers go down. Now the difference is, we now have a vaccine, so that does not have to be our destiny. We can actually keep it as flat as that is and actually have a lower trend. But again, it, it depends on how people behave over the holidays, and we hope that uh, we won't see that spike again. And we're continuing to lose people. We have uh, 35 people who are lost uh, over the last day, and I want to extend our sympathies to their families. And it's you know, I actually lost two relatives uh, related to my husband just in the last week as well. So it's still continuing. Um, vaccine progress, yes. Uh, shooting for 90% for at 86.8% in terms of our 18 plus with one dose. If you got one dose, don't forget the second one. And uh, you're not fully inoculated and protected until you get that other dose. But our, our, our numbers with the young people are going up. That number was quite a bit lower the first when we started tracking this. So we're at about 60% uh, up from 50%, making some progress with the older children. So that's that's good news as well. We watched the breakthroughs. Everybody knows somebody who got vaccinated who though came down with the uh, the virus after being vaccinated. I don't, I'm not aware of cases where people have had booster shots and had a breakthrough case, but we'll be certainly monitoring that in case that starts happening. But the point is, is that while these are testing positive, it does not mean they have anywhere near the severity that they would have experienced had they uh, not been vaccinated. And our hospitalizations, again, still sticking around those. That's what we watch, hospitalizations of the breakthrough infections, and those are uh, those are actually not in a bad place right now. So what I mentioned at the outset, great news from the FDA on pediatric vaccinations. They just okayed Pfizer to be able to be allocated for children ages 5 to 11. We have been waiting for this. Parents have been waiting for this. Schools have been waiting for this. And this is really a breakthrough. And we saw too many narratives and pictures of children in other parts of the country struggling on ventilators and in hospitals, and it's a, it's a, it's a f scary specter for parents. And I, this is how we can protect them. We now have this available. We've been taking, making preparations for weeks now. I had spoke to the New York chapter of the American Council of American Academy of Pediatrics to get all their pediatricians on board. We've been in com regular communication with all the providers. So it's going to be various places that parents can go to to have their children vaccinated as soon as it's available. So let's check out the timeline there in a minute. But I first of all I want to introduce someone because this is such a serious campaign, a campaign to convince parents and schools and everybody else that their children need to be vaccinated uh, to get them into different facilities, get them into the schools, get them into the uh, pediatrician's office that I wanted to dedicate a real expert to this, uh, Dr. Emily Lutterlow. She is the New York State Director of Ep Ep Epidemiology. She's going ahead our efforts to vaccinate children ages 5 to 11. She is a very experienced doctor. She's an expert. She's certified in infectious disease and pediatric infectious disease, which is like a very 
specialized area, but we have the expert. She worked at the CDC before, so she knows what she's doing there. And uh, we're delighted to have her joining us today. And I'd like her to come up and say a couple words about the approach we're taking to make sure that we get more children vaccinated. Dr. Ludolo. Thank you, Governor. Good, after good afternoon, everyone. Vaccinations against COVID-19 are key to overcoming this pandemic. We have over 1.5 million kids aged 5 to 11 in New York State, and we would like to vaccinate them and get them protected as soon as we can. Here in New York, we've been preparing for this for weeks. We've been working with our partners like the, the New York State chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. We launched a Vax to School campaign to get kids vaccinated, and we'll expand that effort for the 5 to 11 age group. And we'll continue to get the word out that these are really good vaccines. They're safe, they've been tested, they're effective, and they're free and easily available. I'm the mother of three children, two of whom are in the 5 to 11 age group, and I've been looking forward to getting them vaccinated basically since the vaccines first came out. Like a lot of parents, I've dealt with the kids getting sick and having to keep them home from school and get them tested, and I even had one in quarantine. We all want to get back to normal, and the fastest way to do that is to get as many people vaccinated as we can. Once we have the CDC recommendations, we can start uh, vaccinating this age group. We know that parents want to be able to talk to their child's pediatrician and get the kids vaccinated where they go for their other medical care. That means we need our pediatricians and other clinicians who see children to talk to parents about the vaccine and to encourage those who are eligible to get the vaccine and to give the vaccine in their office. I found that the more I learn about the COVID vaccine, the more it makes sense to get it done. So if you're a parent, ask your pediatrician if they'll be giving the COVID-19 vaccine. Talk to them about any concerns you have. Be sure to get the facts from a trusted, reliable source like your doctor, and then make your appointments. And pediatricians, please plan to provide the vaccine to your patients. Join your colleagues who have already enrolled in the New York State COVID-19 vaccination program and start scheduling your patients as soon as you can. If you have questions, reach out to us or reach out to your colleagues. We're also setting up webinars for pediatricians, so please join us. And again, vaccinating all New Yorkers against COVID-19, including our children, is a key part of what we need to do to overcome this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lutterlow. On top of everything else you're doing to help protect the people of the state, you're also taking care of three children. So thank you. And so thank you for bringing that very personal perspective to the urgency associated with getting our children protected. Again, we're heading into the time when more kids will be indoors, they're more exposed, and there might be some sense of we're getting a little tired of wearing the masks and kids are going to, you know, we're not sure what they're going to do. We know once they get inoculated, once they get this vaccine, they will be safe. And that's so important for all of us, as you say, to get back to normal. So thank you, Doctor. So on the timetable, the great news was just last night, the FDA advisory committee recommended Pfizer for five to 11 year olds. And now the next step is for the CDC to meet. And they'll meet over the uh, November 2nd to November 3rd. We hope that happens, uh, maybe I mean on the 2nd. And then we'll be looking forward to their guidance. So in terms of planning for this, we are, are, um, we've been ordering and I'll give you some numbers on the supplies we've been ordering, but it is imminent. It is happening soon. And this is extremely exciting news. We've been waiting this for a long time. Uh, so we've already ordered a uh, lot of vaccination or vaccines. We've our early preparation office uh, efforts are paying off. We've had over 370 providers across New York already pre-ordered 880, uh, 800, 380,000 pediatric doses from the Department of Health. We're also actually making sure that they're available in every region. So these are not these are just the first wave. There'll be orders available throughout. I have been assured because I keep asking this question when I'm talking to White House, talking to Pfizer, talking to anybody else. Will we have enough? Because all of us remember uh, the frustration of the early days when as more categories of people were eligible to receive the vaccine and the supplies were uh, short and, and there's in short supply. People were traveling all over the state. There's a lot of frustration so we will not go to that place again we want to make sure I, th I think there'll be an initial rush of people wanting these which is good uh, i suspect there'll come a time when parents who would not get their kids get themselves vaccinated we may have to have some more conversations with them on how important this is so this is our first wave of the region the regions how many are going this is where they're going 
Uh, you can go through the list here to see the pre-orders from New York State. And what's interesting, the chain pharmacies also get uh, you know, tens of thousands of additional doses directly from the federal government. So that number is not in here, but it, there, there will be plenty. So we'll see where we need to bump up the efforts. Uh, doctor, I want to thank you for, again, overseeing this whole effort to make sure there's plenty of supply as well as locations where these can be distributed. So this is what we're working on. And school districts as well. We've uh, reached out to all the school districts saying, what are your plans? Can you help us get these in schools? And so far, uh, 350 school districts, have been, they intend to hold vaccination events. And on uh, 390 thus far said they'll send out communications. So we have asked the school districts to tell us how they want to do it. Do they want to do it in the school? Are they going to partner with the local health departments, working with local pharmacies, school-based health centers? So uh, there's a lot of different ways to approach this but they are fully engaged and this is really important. One more thing I want to talk about is uh, those of you who dine at all in New York City know that you cannot walk into a restaurant without showing your, your uh, cell phone pass. Most of you probably have it, not paper, but on your cell phone, the Excelsior pass, which has been great to show that you've been vaccinated. So we want more people to come to New York. We want them to go to our restaurants. We want them to go to our plays. I was at a play Friday night, had to show my pass to walk in the door. That's great. But as people come from other parts of the country and around the world, we want to make sure that their states have the same blueprint that we developed so they can download this, start taking the steps necessary so their own residents can travel freely. And we want to make sure that our New York residents can travel to other states that have this requirement. So we're trying to create the synergy. We've been working closely on this so we can welcome back people to all of our entertainment venues, our cultural event venues and other places to make sure that... Um, there's no barriers, no barriers to people coming to our great state to enjoy the reopening. And on our booster update, yes, that is me. I guess we call that a green screen. I didn't realize that was going to be green behind me there. Uh, my staff warned me that someone could do something funny when you're in front of a green screen. I hope, to, hope they're wrong. Uh, I had a J&J, &J, so I was eligible to receive the, the, uh, re the um, booster shot. I will say it did not hurt. I did not have any ill effects. My staff kept checking in, are you okay? I kept a full day of interviews and meetings and uh, all the way through the night, and I didn't miss a beat. So I anticipate that uh, many people have developed uh, sort of a resistance to this, and it is a smaller dose. So I felt great after it, and I felt really good and safer. You literally feel safer once you have that booster shot. So anybody who's not had their primary series, uh, get one, two, and now this will be your third shot. If you had J&J, &J, you only have one to go. And uh, we've had already 787,000 New Yorkers had a booster shot, 787,000. That's, that's extraordinary. But we have 5.5 uh, uh, 5 .5 million New Yorkers are eligible. So we want to make sure those numbers get up. This is what we have so far. Uh, you can see the chart on where people are getting their, their uh, booster shots. I'm not aware of any shortage of supply. And this is something we monitor intensely to make sure that everybody has what they need out, in, out throughout the state. We are going to continue our Get Out the Facts campaign because one of the reasons we're identifying why people are not getting vaccinated is that they are believing the lies on social media. It's dangerous, it's misleading, and it puts people at risk, and it's hindering our entire battle against COVID because people are reading this. Uh, Facebook's most viewed article in early 2021 raised doubt about the COVID vaccine. Well, that's great news. Also, misinformation. Uh, someone hijacked the... Uh, uh, rochesterfirst.com and put out misinformation making it look like it was legitimate from us on on how you would need a vaccination before you can get a driver's license putting out falsities putting out lies and it is dangerous so we want people to get the facts we have a get out the facts campaign to combat the misinformation so please share this with others that you know and we're targeting misinformation about pregnancy and fertility and side effects and safety and, and all sorts of other government conspiracy theories so uh, who would have thought that uh, something like this could happen, but it has, and we have to fight back, and this is how we're going to fight back. So our next, next vaccine mandates are right around the corner, November 1st. Uh, we had those in place to make sure that uh, all of our healthcare workers are fully vaccinated, and we have 86.4% eight, already met the mandate in our psychiatric centers. That's great. Our office for people with developmental disabilities and our hospitals there, already 100% vaccinated. That, that's incredible. So further proof that these vaccine mandates have worked. 
I'm really proud of the people who stepped up and all the healthcare institutions and entities across the state. And as a result, when people enter one of our healthcare facilities, they will have the confidence to know that the person taking care of them will not make them sicker than they were when they walked in by contracting COVID. So that's the good news. And to wrap up our football, uh, we have had our, comp our campaign. We had some players here a couple weeks ago. And those of you from the Buffalo area know that's Bruce Smith. We had 60 winners in total, and I want to thank New York's teams, uh, the Jets, the Giants, and the Bills for participating in this. We had over 60 winners who won tickets and all sorts of great swag, and so thank them, and we wish them the very best for the rest of their season. I have all their records on the screen, but I'm not going to say them because uh, only two out of this, one out of the three teams is going to be happy with that. So uh, I look forward to seeing the Jets and the Bills play soon, and when the Bills match up against the Giants, I'll be there too. It's not this season. So we're constantly watching our football, and I thank them again for uh, validating the importance of what we're doing on how they want their fans to get vaccinated. So that is our story for the week. I look forward to taking your questions. Okay. I know it's maybe a little premature at this stage, but do you anticipate at some point, given that these vaccines will be available for children to be attending school, some kind of mandate, much like you have for measles and the ones you know, going forward where anybody who comes to a public school would actually have to be vaccinated? That is a possibility. It's on the table. And as I've said all along, I want to empower parents and the schools to do the right thing first. But if we're not seeing adequate compliance or we're seeing the numbers start going up. This is this is what we're monitoring closely. If I start seeing infection rate going up, hospitalizations going up, more children being affected, I will have no choice. But right now, the numbers are good. We can get the kids voluntarily vaccinated. Parents will hopefully do the right thing and I'll keep an eye on that situation. So I know those who suggested mandatory vaccinations uh, in the city of New York, that's for next September anyhow, they're not talking about. I'm willing to make decisions even sooner should the need arise. So all options are on the table for sure. Governor, talking about vaccine mandates, there's a, a wide disparity right now between New York's regulations and New Jersey's regulations when it comes to workers, schools, dining. Does that at all concern you that, you know, the, there's such strict regulations here but New Jersey is, is almost a free-for-all at this point. The governor does not seem willing to put in any regulations anytime soon beyond a vaccine or test kind of situation. Believe it or not, my focus is on 20 million New Yorkers, not what's happening in a neighboring state. Uh, we have worked very closely with our neighboring partners on many of these initiatives. And New York City, you know, the city, not the state, put in some of these restrictions. This is how I'm going to be uh, turning state government upside down empowering localities to do what they want. The city of New York wants to have a vaccine mandate for their workers and to be able to go into a play or go to a restaurant. That is the prerogative of New York City. Again, I'm keeping all the options on the table if I see higher numbers, but right now I don't think that that is necessary at this moment in time. So we will leave New Jersey to do what they think is best for their residents. And right now uh, we're in a good place in the state of New York. Yeah. I understand that topic of mandates. Um, on Friday, the municipal uh, workers are required to get not, uh, vaccinated. That goes into effect this week, and it's in the city. Um, but if there is a shortage of workers, such as like police, is there any plan that the state has to help out with that? I will always reach out my hand in friendship and in support to the city of New York. This is a new era of collaboration, and if they need our assistance to provide basic services for the constituents that we mutually represent, I will be there to assist. Hey, Governor. So I come with the Buffalo question. Um, the NFL owners meetings are in town this week, as you, here in New York City this week, as you know. And um, I was told you were a topic of conversation in a positive way. They are happy that you've gotten the different sides talking in the negotiations for a new Buffalo Bills stadium. Um, we know you have a study underway. Um, what we're wondering about is um, what is your timeline for a deal? Um, some of the other people at the table are hoping by the end of the year. Um, are you hoping mm -hmm. to see a deal by the end of the year? Um, what, what, what kind of timeline are you operating? Uh, the timeline is one that we will accomplish my overall objective, which is to keep the Buffalo Bills in Buffalo. The report that you referred to was contracted by the state of New York um, last year, earlier this year. It's AECOM is doing the study. They're analyzing a number of factors. One is to rehabilitate the existing facility or new and the costs associated with it. The other one is to keep it in Orchard Park or to go downtown. So the study is very comprehensive. It took more time than I thought it would, but it's 
uh, it's ready to be released uh, very shortly. So I would say within a few days. Uh, I'll be, I promise transparency. Um, maybe this is a little unprecedented, but I want to get that in the hands of everyone. But uh, the conversations are going very well. And in terms of a completion, that this will be a budgetary issue and therefore will show up in the New York State budget as an item once I've had a chance to speak to the legislators and garner support for that. So that's really the timeline. Uh, there'll be plenty of time to get the job done. So the Buffalo Bills know there's a commitment, uh, a shared effort uh, to finance this, and uh, those are the details being, work, being worked out. So it is very positive right now. The, uh, the owners are correct. So. Governor hey, Hyde, Jason Wolf with the Buffalo News, piggybacking off of Tim's questions and, and the topic of vaccine mandates. The Bills Stadium uh, vaccine mandate goes into full effect at the end of this month. Uh, as you know, the, they put it into effect. At least partial vaccinations were required for the last several home games. What has been the effect of that, in your opinion, and would you like to see more vaccine mandates at, at major sporting events and, and similar events? I'm very proud of the Buffalo Bills and the other sports teams that have instituted mandatory vaccinations before they had people gather. Uh, you've been to a game. You've been to a tailgating party. People, even though it's outdoors, you're in close proximity. There's a lot of shouting going on. I'm not sure all the masks are on all the time. I've seen a lot of people without masks. So having experienced this, I know that the safest uh, wait, the safest path forward is to have that vaccine mandate. I want to thank the teams that have stepped up. I think they're working. So. We'll compile the list and get right to you. A little bit louder, please. Governor, your first question comes from Andrew Siff at WNBC-TV in New York. Andrew, your mic is open. Governor, good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. I asked you last week about the possibility of mass vaccination sites once uh, things expanded to the children. I'm wondering where that stands, in particular, if you're relying on pediatric offices, how fast could this progress when you're talking about one and a half million kids? Wouldn't it be more efficient to have weekend events at some place like the Javits Center or other sites where you used to have mass vac setups? Well, we still have 12 mass vac sites that have not been disabled. They're still in place, and that is an option for us to do so. As I said before, we can be very nimble if we want to adapt to this and make that available. I'm a parent. I think that most parents are going to feel most comfortable in a place where they know the person administering that shot, especially the younger kids, five, six, seven, eight. So we're going to let the pediatrician offices handle this for now, but also it's not just them. We are working with the schools. I personally think the best place is in a school. The children are there. School nurse, or we send in people who to provide this service. They're working with local pharmacies to get it done. So that with permission slips that we are literally writing for the school so they don't have to do any extra work. I think that's your pediatrician's office, the schools, setting up clinics, uh, other, again, the pharmacies are still available. Every corner has a pharmacy. That's where it's also available. So I have no hesitation to scale up and do mass vac sites, but I'm not sensing the demand for people to get in their cars and drive their kids there uh, in that circumstance. But again, it, and it's on the table. There's no reason why we wouldn't do it if we thought the need was there, but we can turn on a dime. Thank you, Governor. Your final question today comes from Jeff Cole, WWNY-TV. Jeff, your mic is open. Governor, how are you? From Great. Watertown. Hey, Jeff. So off the topic of COVID, but under the Cuomo administration, New York State was on track to close more state prisons. i uh, like to know where you stand on state prisons and are there more closures on the table? I did an analysis of the uh, capacity and the occupancy of our state prisons when my first week on the job. And what I found is that there are many facilities, particularly upstate, that are only half full and that we will be looking at a, uh, a scaling down initiative. But also my question is always uh, about the workers who have made this their career. I, I don't live far from some of these facilities in upstate New York, my home, and I know it has an impact on the local economy. So the question is, if these are to be converted from 
incarcerating individuals, is there another use they can be used for? I want to get creative with this. I don't know that some of these can be used as uh, substance abuse treatment centers, residential facilities. So these are buildings that I'm looking at the, co the cost and also the opportunity associated with uh, converting them to a different purpose. But we don't need as many prisons. The number of people incarcerated has gone down dramatically in our state. So that's, that's something that's absolutely on the table and we're looking at right now. All right, thank you very much. Question on a different topic. You may be aware that there are some cab drivers on hunger strike outside City Hall. They've been on hunger strike for a week now. They want to see a much more comprehensive bailout solution from the city than what they've been given so far. Uh, I wanted to see, do you sympathize with them and, and are there any potential solutions that the state is interested in helping out on this cause? I'm happy to have a conversation and see if the city needs us to step in and help them in any way. Um, I don't like the sound of these people. They've had their livelihoods devastated during this pandemic. Just look at what Midtown was like just a few months ago. Nobody was here. And it's a time of great anxiety for these individuals. So I'm very sympathetic to their cause. And uh, I'm happy to reach out and see if the city needs us. Again, this whole era of people saying we're going to work together. We do a lot of this behind the scenes, preparations for storms. Thank God the storm wasn't as bad as we had anticipated, but we are, you know, lock, locked in with the city to be, make sure we respond. So, so I'm, I'm happy to look into that question. Um, thank you. Thanks for coming out today, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you.